A very good morning to you. Um, I've got 20 minutes to do what normally takes 55 minutes, so I'll talk quite quickly. I'm sorry about that. Um, I was in the British Army um, there, uh, for five years in Germany uh, in the Cold War, and all we learned was how to retreat from the German border in tanks. So I got bored and joined the Sultan's Army at a time when world Marxism was doing very well. And uh, so I joined the army. This is the Sultan's uh, Navy back then. That's his army. Um, this was my reconnaissance platoon. There were about 60 of us. Um, I had learned Arabic in uh, Beaconsfield. And uh, so we were able to communicate. Um, this is the Sultan's Air Force, or one half of it, uh, <laughs> photographed, obviously, from the other half. Um, if you look carefully, the team uh, consisted of people from uh, Oman, Zanzibar, Baluchistan, myself, European. Uh, all of us were, of course, Muslim. I was a Muslim for three years. I was out there. Um, <laughs> There were about 3,000 members of the People's Front and the opposition. There were only 180 of us in the army. So I learned to be flexible by never moving in an easy target like a Land Rover. So we only moved by night for three years out there. But I had to leave the Sultan's army, um, unfortunately. We, over the three years, were the only army patrol on the, t the total saudi yemeni Omani border. Uh, it was a great time, but if you went too many times on the same track, they would put mines which would blow a Land Rover over 100 meters and the people further than that. So you learn to be alert. I was thrown out of the British Army because I had failed to get A-levels at school, so I couldn't go to Sandhurst like the American West Point. And so when I was thrown out of the Army, purely because of the lack of A-levels, I was 24 years old and uh, my career was behind me. So I got married at the time, and my wife decided what we could do to make a living was to do what I'd been doing in the army, teaching soldiers how to climb and ski in Germany in order to stop them beating each other up in the canteen, which they did because they were very bored because the Soviet army never bothered to attack. <laughs> now, the, that was paid for by the taxpayer in the army, but now my wife and I had to start a new career with nothing, no money whatsoever. So we started to think, let's do big projects beyond anything other people had done. So back in 1968, we did the first ever journey up the longest river in the world, which is the Nile at 4,000 miles. We decided to use a new thing called a hovercraft. There were two seaters. They could lift three centimeters above the surface. We took nine months to complete the Nile because there were a lot of four-centimeter obstacles. Uh, um, we, we moved to all sorts of dif different uh, projects, maybe 12 big expeditions all over the world. This one was at the invitation of the British Columbian government, um, which is, they had a centenary. They'd only been a Canadian province for 100 years. So they asked us as a Scottish unit, because all the explorers who discovered it had been Scots, to do the first ever journey from their Yukon border, 3,500 miles down the Rocky Mountain Rivers, the roughest in the world, uh, to the United States border at Vancouver. Uh, we took uh, quite a long time to do that. I used people from the Army. They had three weeks leave. We took eight months, so they were not popular when they got back. Um, <laughs> This particular uh, rapid, Hell's Gate, some of you may know it if you come from Canada. Um, we had four boats, three people in each boat. That one went the wrong way and got turned over, and we found their bodies three miles downstream, which could have stopped the entire expedition, but uh, luckily that was just the, the BBC film crew. <laughs> um, Round about, I think, 1975, we had a problem because in our industry, if you call it that, fashion changed. And whatever you're in, you've got to respond quickly. And my boss, my literary agent in New York, decided that we must stop doing hot expeditions because the fashion uh, was to do only cold polar ones. So my wife decided we must start ambitiously in the polar world by doing the first ever journey vertically around Earth's surface without flying one meter of the 52,000 uh, miles. So I was sent to a library by her to find the best route. 
And I quickly discovered that at the bottom there was a place called Antarctica, far bigger than China and India stuffed together, but with no Tesco's en route. <laughs> now, nobody had ever crossed it from side to side. I'm talking about the world's experts. So we had only spent a winter in Scotland, so we didn't sound much chance. <laughs> Up at the top, I found there was another obstacle called the Arctic Ocean, 2,000 miles of it, which also had never been crossed by experts. So I went home, as you would, and I told my wife it was a stupid idea. She became quite unpleasant. Um, so I, therefore, went back to the library. Um, you, have, you have to be first. If you're second, you won't get sponsorship, and we depend upon sponsorship. We knew that the great American explorer at that time, Walt Pedersen, was after being first to both poles, didn't want to go the whole way around, so we were in a hurry. But we worked every day, every week for seven years unpaid in order to raise 1,900 sponsors from all over the world, including a 40-year-old ship. We found a team of 52 people who gave up pretty much their lives, as it turned out, for eight years unpaid to join us. We had to have a ship to drop us off. Uh, over a three-year period, because that was how long it would take to do the first and only journey around Earth's polar surface. We um, arrived at Antarctica seven years after we started work on it. We were unloaded by the ship's crew, all volunteers. They said goodbye, went round the other side of the Pacific below New Zealand to wait in case our group of three managed to do the first crossing of Antarctica. The... Um, the problem was you can't just arrive there and cross because it gets dark. It goes down to minus 122 degrees centigrade. That's up at 7,000 feet above sea level, where we would have to spend eight months. Because we needed a lighthouse, a light not heavy one, uh, my wife designed one in Wales out of paper, which you could paint to make it harder. It could withstand minus 30 degrees and winds of 40 miles an hour. That uh, winter, we had 160 mile an hour winds. So you might think we would be flattened and cold. But because the snow was designed to drift up to the roof, giving us insulation and protection, but then, of course, you could not get out. Uh, you might think, well, why would you want to? Well, we were cooking with gasoline in a paper house. So getting out was important. <laughs> We eventually, the sun came back after eight months. The thermometer rose to minus 68. So we left the base leader. In those days, no GPS, so it was Morse code communications, no sat phone. We left the base commander. That is the nastiest job. So I gave it to my wife, uh, Ginny, because the whole thing had been her fault for thinking of it. Um, <laughs> but she was a little person and could not roll 45-gallon drums about in the snow. So a man had to be living with my wife for three years. <laughs> So I did not want somebody who was physically attractive in that position. But uh, luckily, we found a Yorkshireman for that particular job. <laughs> um, we did the first ever crossing of 900 miles. No human being had been there before. Nobody knew how high it was. There were no polar orbiting satellites. We mapped an area bigger than France, uh, probably the last time a terrestrial map was made before uh, polar satellites made that sort of thing redundant. We eventually uh, reached the other side of the world. You know you're there because there's only one active volcano on the Pacific coast. From that point, we then carried on. Uh, Ginny's plan, made nine years before off a map in London, was to, the ship would collect us, which it did. Two other ships were sunk in the ice down there, but ours got through. The people were still on board, still unpaid. Two of them were dead, but the rest were still there. They moved up the Greenwich Meridian, past, as you can see on the map, Australia, Los Angeles, Vancouver, through the Bering Straits, which are just up there. Um, that is the Greenwich Meridian, which was what we were more or less following. 500 miles north of Alaska, up in the ocean is the North Pole, and all the ice, three million ton ice flows, move at three miles an hour, and when they hit, they will sink your ship. Therefore, when she made the plan, she decided the ship would drop the three of us in the land group off in uh, rubber boats at the mouth of the Yukon River. We would then go 1,200 miles up the Yukon onto the Mackenzie River going north uh, for 800 miles. And then we would switch from the rubber boats, by now there are only two of us, not three, into a 15-foot Boston whaler, which was open, to go through the Northwest Passage. It was the first time uh, any human being had been through the Northwest Passage uh, in a single season. From the North Pole, 
all this ice comes down even in midsummer against the North Canadian coast, which is where the passage is. We were very lucky. We managed to get through it seven days and nights with no stopping, but the boat at that point froze in. The sea froze, so boats become useless. So we had 400 miles still to go, which we hadn't planned for, so you have to be flexible. We had skis with us, so on the second day, unfortunately, the other bloke, um, Charlie Burton, South African guy, uh, his skis broke, which was extremely irritating, which I told him, which was uh, not, not a good idea, because mine broke shortly after that. Um, <laughs> You must uh, always have belt and braces. If your skis break, you've got to have snowshoes. Unfortunately, he got fungus. The skin fell off one of his feet. He then got um, hemorrhoids. He then fell over and cracked his head on a rock, and his eyes filled up with blood, and he started to complain. He basically... <laughs> we then spent eight months uh, up in the north waiting for the dark period to go. One month before the sun came back at that latitude, we said goodbye to... Jenny in the two huts, and a week after we left, one of them, where all the parachutes were stored for the eight-month attempt to cross the Arctic via the North Pole, caught fire. She tried to put the fire out and did a bad job, as you can see. Um, <laughs> sent a, a Morse code message. We were 200 miles away out on the ice by then in the dark. All the pictures I took uh, in the dark came out black, so there's no point showing them. Um, but that is what it did look like in, in, in the darkness. You can see steam there. Basically, that is minus 60. You do not expect open water, but there's so much movement for the current and the wind that it's a nasty place to be in the dark because you can tread on sludge uh, and then it goes over your head. That was a nasty bit, but we did reach the North Pole and became the first human beings in history to reach both poles. So we put a flag there because people do, uh, but it's pretty stupid because within one hour, that flag is half a mile from the pole because the ice is sort of floating. If you go there and you want to put your flag there, uh, dig a hole in the ice, swim down 17,000 feet to the seabed, put your flag there, and it will stay put. Uh, we did not do that. At that particular point, we knew that we wanted to go to Greenwich, which was um, south on, on the compass. But unfortunately, so was every other potential destination in the world. <laughs> So this caused uh, hostility between the two of us at that point. <laughs> we only got 400 miles before the annual breakup. It's like a tsunami. It's very noisy. It's not good for imagination. This is why we have ex-military people who don't have imagination. Um, we spent, we sat on an ice floe which got smaller under breakage for three months, floating towards Siberia. We never got bored because Charlie over on the left there had a solar panel which gave us enough power to listen to the BBC World Service for two minutes every day if there was reception. And one particular day with his headsets on, Charlie said, the United Kingdom is at war. So I said, who with? And he said, oh, I didn't get that bit. Um, <laughs> we, we sat for five days of bad radio reception arguing who the hell it could be. Um, we knew that Mrs. Thatcher was aggressive, but we could, couldn't work out who with. I mean, obviously, we assumed it was France, but we had no proof. When, when, they, when they said it was Argentina, we thought that was just a stupid BBC joke. We, we also did not get um, bored because we got visited over those three months. Um, they weigh one and a half tons. Uh, up there, they are very hungry because they kill near land. They will go for you. You smell of hot blood, and when you're attacked in that area by a bear, the best thing you can do, really, is to uh, shoot it. Now, if you do that, you will be put in prison immediately by the Canadian police. Or, well, you would if there were any up there. Um, <laughs> the rules before you leave Canada, you do not open fire unless they attack you from 10 meters. That's going to be too late for you. Even then, you are not allowed to shoot unless their body language is aggressive. Well... <laughs> How do you know? On page 80, it explains that an aggressive bear's tail will always be at 45 degrees to the ground. But when they attack you, you cannot see their tail. But they also explain that only 10% eat humans, but you can't ask them which percentage they belong to. We had, we, eight years before, we designed canoes with skis in case this happened. Our flow was deteriorating. The ship came up from uh, Europe to try and rescue us. Uh, they got stuck and uh, began to sink. Uh, two months later, by which time we were really panicking, they got stuck only 18 miles away, so we managed to reach them. I don't know if you can see, but if you look carefully just over there, that's us. 
When we arrived on the ship after eight months out on the floating ice, humans had been around Earth's surface for the first time in history by any route. Nobody's ever done it again. Uh, only two people have ever been around Earth's surface. More people have actually been on the moon. We kept our team together, and throughout the 1980s and 90s, using aerospace technology, we beat all our rivals, including the Norwegians, to the world records north and south. We used uh, amphibious equipment, which weighed nothing apart from a paddle, to go through Shugo, which had previously been impossible. We used political lateral thought, because Gorbachev in 1992 said, Glasnost, I wrote, Dear Mr. Gorbachev, can I do the first expedition from Siberia, not from North America, uh, from Cape Artichiski. It's the best place to set out from, but it uh, was a missile site, secret missile site. So I had to sign a contract that whilst there I would take no photos. I did not. The other members of the team did. <laughs> um, we, we broke the world records from Russia for the next nine years, but unfortunately, over in Arabia, over that period, I had spent eight big expeditions in uh, vehicles looking for the lost city uh, in the greatest desert in the world, the Rub al-Khali empty quarter. And I was just about to find it in 1992 when, unfortunately, NASA, that's Pasadena, California, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they put cameras on the shuttle, and from 170 kilometers in space, they take photos. That is the empty quarter desert. Between each brown line of dunes, you've got 50 miles. That's 80 kilometers. That is a NASA professor. If you look at that map, and you're looking for lost cities, like I was, but without the shuttle, you can identify a lost city 30 feet under the sand. It becomes obvious by looking at a NASA photograph with bioptics. It's, it's a system, well, it's really cheating. Um, <laughs> they, they identified the lost city out there because it was all right angles, and they assumed that people make things with right angles. But actually, when my archaeologist got out there, um, we, where we found the lost city, he said this is not... Uh, uh, made by man, it's made by God, using right angles in order to fool NASA. So we, um, just to finish up with, um, I'm going to mention an expedition in the mid-90s. We were doing it because we heard that our main rivals from Norway were about to do it. So we switched what we were doing and planned to do the first uh, unsupported crossing of Antarctica. Uh, those were the four expeditions by then that had crossed Antarctica, including the Blue Line, which was uh, our transglobe expedition. The Red Line was the American uh, Steger. The Yellow Line was the world's greatest climber, Reinhold Messner from Italy, together with Germany's top man, Arved Fuchs. And lastly, the Green Line was in the 1950s, led by Sir Edmund Hillary, who'd previously climbed Everest, and Dr. Fuchs, the top European polar man. But all four of us had used air support. Now, in the 90s, we're talking about doing it uh, without any form of support at all. There are crevasses. That was the Hillary Fuchs expedition. Uh, some of them are 300 foot deep. Uh, you don't want to fall into them if you want the expedition to succeed. Um, we arrived, our team, at the start point. That is where the Atlantic Ocean hits Antarctica's coast. The ski plane dropped us off and said goodbye. They'd see us again in 2,000 miles' time. Everything you carry on day one must last you for 2,000 miles. Uh, we towed 500 pounds each. That's 1,000 pounds between two people. We, the other guy with me is Europe's top physiologist. He specializes in studying the effects of starvation on the human body and muscle cannibalization. So he was in his element on this expedition. <laughs> He monitored our output as 8,500 calories every day for 97 days with no rest day. We could only carry 5,000, so we had a daily deficiency for 97 days of 3,500 calories. I set out at 15.5 stone. By the halfway, I was under 9 stone. We were skeletal. Uh, this is even Weight Watchers would not recommend this um, <laughs> method. Uh, our feet um, were not good because towing that weight affects uh, your toes. Uh, your lips also are damaged because of the ozone hole, which is right ahead. At night, all the scabs, when you go to sleep, stick together. You wake up in the morning, you must say good morning to the other bloke. It's called team dynamics. Um, <laughs> but, but you cannot because your lips are all scabbed together, so you prod it. And then you're sharing porridge out of a communal bowl for breakfast, so all your blood goes in his porridge, which causes bad relations. Uh, navigation. 
You don't need to be very clever to work out the time on that man's watch. Okay, he's heading for the South Pole. He's treading on his shadow. The sun is due north at midday, so it's got to be midday on his watch. So an hour later, and this is how we navigated, I'm going to say, there is my shadow. It's 1 o'clock. The sun moves 15 degrees an hour, so I'm going to go 15 degrees to the right of the shadow, 2 o'clock, 30 degrees. And that was how you navigated until 1995 when the first polar orbiting satellites arrived and GPS was possible. Crevasses, you've got well over... 8,000 to cross. You can't see them because they're covered with snow normally until you've gone into them, by which time the information is too late. So I therefore developed a very careful policy, which is to watch the bloke ahead. Um, nobody's going to fall into that one. There's a big hole up there, which you would see. You could just see somebody up there. We reached the pole, at which point our Norwegian competitors fell out pretty much dead. The only reason we carried on the other half of the expedition was because my colleague had a contract with Lancet magazine, Europe's top medical magazine, about advanced starvation. And at the pole, he'd measured our weight and found that we were starving even more than he had hoped. And he was um, <laughs> determined to complete the article, even if it was posthumous. So we carried on. Um, I began to uh, hate him. Um, I'd done six expeditions with him before. The most difficult polar expedition of all time, which we're planning at the moment, will also be with him. But I did hate him. Every five days, he took your blood for science. Didn't have much blood left. Every eight days, he made you drink a container of liquid costing $1,000, which for 24 hours after you drink it, any liquid coming out of your body must be collected for science, especially urine. Um, now, at minus 90 average, uh, Peeing into a pee bottle at minus 90 is lethal for that part of your body if you are male. Um, although, obviously, at that sort of temperature, the difference between males and females is not great. Um, his hands became very bad. The blisters on top of your ski sticks in the mitts, uh, in the blisters you get ice balls. So if you arrive at the tent at night and shake your hand, it sounds like castanets. Then the blisters will fall off, leaving raw skin. Um, that's my hand about five years ago. That was the result of me making a mistake for about three minutes in 39 years. You need to retain your focus totally at all times on these trips. We did eventually reach the other side of Antarctica, uh, that is the Pacific Ocean. We were pretty much dead by then, but we got there and had gone that little bit beyond which any of our previous uh, people had done. Um, it became and is today the longest polar unsupported journey in history, and we went on to many more expeditions. But after 40 years of staying ahead of our rivals, I would say that the one thing that you have got to remember at all times is that you will not get sponsorship on which we depend without staying ahead of your rivals at all times. Thank you. <laughs>